is very good at restoring things. We've restored the SP9010 to the state it's in today. It's not finished. Nothing is finished ever. The PLA works very hard at doing these restorations because we care about preserving these items for the future. When we agreed to take the SP9010, our goal was strictly to give it a cosmetic restoration. Uh, but thanks to all you people who backed us, thanks to the international support that we've received for this, our goal has been expanded. We intend to restore that to operating condition. Right? Once again, it's thanks to the support of the community Right. The train lovers, the train fans, right? We do it because we love it. We do it because you love it, right? And as long as that love is there, we will continue to do it. So now I'd like to turn it over to Bob Zank. Henry basically said the truth. It is, uh, it is from love. And from a sense that we, when we look at these projects, we always see potential. The, the, the gorgeous paint and the beautiful shine on that is what we see in our minds when we're looking at a rusty piece that, you know, that was six years ago. And to hold on to that vision is one thing. To have the skill of Howard Wise, who is the man who is the most responsible for this happening. Uh, <laughs> Is, is you need that kind of energy. PLA is full of that kind of energy. And then you need the attention and the support of people who also understand what the goal is, who like the idea, and want to help in any way that they can. And everybody here has done that. Um, we are blessed with a team over here. This is the, these are the 9010, the folks there that, they kind of look like they are together. <laughs> um, and one of the things that Howard did right away was he created a website, he created a work blog, and he said, we have this extraordinary thing, and he did two things. Here's what we're doing with it, but he also did the very 21st century thing, which is, anybody know anything about this, please contact us. And within really almost hours, we heard from folks around the world, from uh, England, from our friend Rob, from Germany, from our friend Dirk, and from our friend uh, Richard. We have, uh, we have a gentleman who is the son of the lead project engineer. So Howard, what's your best estimate on when this thing will be running on its own? Running on its own, I'd say three to four years. Three or four years, so I'll still be alive. I hope so. <laughs> I want to see you back. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Generally, the French, it's a complete coincidence that this came from France. Generally, the French are diesel electric fanatics, just the same as most American locos and pretty much most English. What happened was, when they finally scrapped all these KMs, um, the firm called Plaza from Austria decided that there are loads of fantastic bogies that trucks that have hardly been used sat in scrap Sacramento scrapyard. So they came over and bought 10 bogies. Took it when they wanted matched pairs and they took them back to Austria. Because they're French. 
No, that was Austrians. Oh, it's nothing to do with them. Oh, no, the French. It's not going to come to the French. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This is the Austrians dealing with the Americans now. And the reason they wanted them is because, for one thing, this truck, actually the frame of this truck, was cast, and it was too big for the German factory. It was too big for Cross Modify to cast, uh, so they had the English Steel Castings Company cast these trucks. There was nothing that was this heavy duty that could be built economically to work this piece of track maintenance equipment that was almost 100 feet long. It was a ballast plane, and that could also tow a dozen yeah. loaded cars full of gravel ballast. So someone said, these are available, they're incredibly heavy duty, and we can- Fraction of the cost of building them from scratch. So that's why they were saved at all. And one of our PLA members took a picture of a bunch of these, and we all looked and went, oh yes, the truck's in the scrapyard. And for 40 years, everybody went, oh yeah, those were the trucks in the scrapyard. And none of us knew here yeah. where they went or why. So, mm. oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, they just pulled them out. And they, with with the actual loco itself, I remember when I first got involved and I was speaking to Howard about it. So, what's it like underneath? Because as you can see, it's not traction motors. It's all very expensive, very very fine tolerance gearboxes and carbon shafts that cost humongously obscene amounts of money. And he said, but it's not very good. And all we had is a bare axle and just one gear because they torched all this off and it had all gone. That, the, the actual loco has got nothing underneath. It's just like a like a freight car or plain axles. So I thought, well, that's that because you're never going to raise the money to build these from scratch, and you can't get them from anywhere else. There's no other locos got anything that's similar. But they were there's nothing built for America. There is nothing you can yeah. buy to do this. Not even the biggest fun driver. So that was going to be the end of it. She was only ever going to be stuffed and mounted, or at best, like she has been, pushed up and down, you know, unceremoniously. And then we found out that these, these trucks had been bought and disappeared to Europe. Oh. So then other people have got involved. Richard, he found out that Plaza had built three of these track machines and lots of research and finding photographs and zooming into grainy, horrible pictures. And you can see these trucks underneath. Oh, so they do exist. And it goes on and on and on. And one of them had had them scrapped and new trucks made and so on. But eventually there was one left in France. And then we got a phone call or an, an email from the boss of the firm of this enormous firm that do all the track maintenance and they would got one of these track machines and he said we've got a track machine that we're gonna be getting rid of in a few years he said but maybe you'd want to come and have a look at it and see if it's the sort of thing you'd be interested in so I was press going to go to Paris oh, it's not baby. romantic trust me <laughs> <laughs> so we go to the depot we have a look and they'd spent a fortune overhauling this 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 is where their big depot is they bought the machine here and for a couple of months of maintenance and then back out across the French network to carry on working. And they'd spent all the money, they'd done a lot of work on it, got it all lovely, and it's enormous, it's much bigger than the KM, much bigger. And then the SNCF, being a bit difficult, the French said, nice, you've spent all the money, you can't use it anymore, it's too big and heavy, you've got to get rid of it, you can't use it anymore. So they were a bit miffed, and basically we wanted to buy one truck because that's all we need, there's no point buying two because we've got no front transmission. So we only wanted one truck and a couple of spare shafts and so on, and they sort of wanted to sell it, but wanted to sell the whole thing and recoup some of the money they'd spent. But it's, it's an enormous thing, it's very old, nobody wanted to buy it. So after how many years? It was a couple of years. Two, three years yeah, of emails years. backwards and forwards and yeah. trying to write things in French and they were, basically they weren't interested, really. Three years to the month yeah. from the first time we heard they existed. It was very, very difficult negotiations. but. All we could do was offer them basically peanuts for it. I said the best way to do it is give them twice scrap value because then at least they might be bothered when they cut it up just to save a few chunks for us. So we did that, no real replies. We didn't know what we were doing, what was gonna happen. And then we just got an email out of the blue when we'd pretty much given up, thought, well, that's that. That's the end of it, we'll carry on as we were gonna do and it's just gonna be pushed around. And they said, um, dear Mr. Fern, the machine has been cut up. That's the end of that. The parts have been saved for you when you're ready. Oh. <laughs> and then, of course, then starts the frantic, well, we've got them, what, what can we do? And, and it turned out they'd cut up some of the bits we wanted, but they'd saved us two trucks instead of one, which sounds fantastic until you've got to move one of these. <laughs> and you can't put it in a container because it's too big. It's all out of gauge. Whatever you try and do with it, it's a nightmare. And then I thought, well, do they want twice the money we've offered? Because we only wanted one, and they've saved us two. But after a lot of difficult negotiations, luckily, our other man on the ground in Germany happened to be on there on business and he could go and physically see what was what 
and sort of strong arm him into actually talking to us and answering his emails. So we finally got it all organised. They were happy to give it us for what we paid. We don't want any paperwork. We just want it off our property. And we got the cranes organised from a guy in, in the UK who went over with a big crane and the low loaders, brought them back to the UK and stuck them on basically a skid, which is a container with no sides, all special permission to move it, specially put in the bottom of the ship when it's all over width and it's all a headache. And then off they came. To on a German us. ship. On a German ship <laughs> with difficult paperwork that gave Howard a headache. So there was lots of nice issues to be dealt with. And then there was moss on one of them because they have dirt and so that was impounded. And there's lots and lots of little hoops to jump through. But eventually, a couple of months back, they turned up on two trucks here and they're offloaded and here they are today. So this is this is the primary choice. The other one that sat out there under the tarpaulin has got a gearbox missing, which is irrelevant, it doesn't matter. That still gives us two spare gearboxes and that is the one off. That's, that's the, the connection from the transmission down into all this. These were specially made for these locos. These have been remade. The original ones were got rid of because they were so old. These were remade, which cost God knows what from Boyd, from the original manufacturers. But that, you can't get that anywhere else. And we only had this one on the truck, so if we'd have only got one truck and it would have damaged that gearbox, that would have been the end of the entire loco. It will never work again. So now, because we've got two trucks, we've got a spare. So at least there's the potential that it'll see us all out. We've got a nice stack of expensive spares with covering grease and took away under yeah. the carpet somewhere. And in, but, the, uh, in, the, in the sort of uh, strange karma of the whole thing, these, these trucks were meant to interchange from front to rear during servicing. Uh, one truck wound up on uh, one other locomotive. Uh, 9010 has pieces from many, all yeah. 15 of the other locomotives and different trucks than it was built with. Uh, <coughs> these trucks were built for 9007. And all the gearboxes went different places. One of these gearboxes, and we can't read the, uh, I'm not sure if it's this one or not, but one of these gearboxes was originally built yeah, for 9010. It was in that locomotive. The shell game and 48 years and then. And another, another little Sorry. twist is that <laughs> tyre profiles are different all over the world. Different railways use different profiles, but France and America are the same. So oh. there's no issues of having to turn tyres and mess about. And of course, unlike a diesel electric, you can't just turn a tyre and forget the others. Because it's all connected, all these have to be to the thou, the same diameter. So as it is, they've all been turned, they're all ready, and they, they match American tyre profiles. So that's one less thing that would have been another headache to deal with. You solve one problem, you create three more. So as you can see, you can understand the basic principles of it. It's very different to a diesel electric. This is the thing that interests us. And uh, this is the tried and tested methods in Germany. And this is what they tried over here, but <coughs> they didn't like it. So. Yeah, the, the object of it, the reason that it was so appealing is that in 19, uh, 1958, uh, some of the guys were doing research and development in San Francisco for the Southern Pacific and in Denver for the Rio Grande, Denver Rio Grande Western, read about this German locomotive, which was a predecessor to these, uh, that was their demonstrator, that was a high horsepower, and because these, all these axles are locked together, if that one is on a slippery patch, it doesn't matter to these. And the same, that doesn't matter what the front end sitting on, the back end can get purchased. So, they were able to get more than twice the traction of a diesel electric locomotive in America. And that really got the attention of the Americans, of the American railroads. Even over the fact that it's imported technology, more expensive technology, we don't do that. We don't buy stuff from Europe. It, it was a period in American history where to be a front runner, to be technologically in the fifth, late 50s and 60s, to be on the edge was a good thing. You got coverage in Wall Street Journal, you got coverage in Time Magazine, and your stockholders thought you were fabulous, and this was a good company to invest in. So being pioneering was, was good for them. So these, these guts and the way these are, are constructed uh, were something that had been done in Germany. Uh, and our German friends were telling us that basically after the war, we had not experienced the industrial devastation. We, uh, like pretty much everybody, we started with steam locomotives and electric locomotives. And eventually somebody said we could put a diesel inside this electric locomotive and it would have its own generating plant. And we just stuck with that. That's what we wanted to do. After the war, the Germans said, well, yes, we could do that too. But, you know, it'd be so much better if we used gears and gearboxes and the 
uh, transmissions we invented and all these kinds of things. So, yeah, so start from scratch, clean slate. And the locomotives in Germany were simply two or two and a half times more powerful than what the average of what we were building. And so it really got the attention of the road. And plus a lot of them were twin engine, just like the Chrysler Mapo is. Right. So if you just want to run a few wagons or you want to just switch backwards and forwards, you don't need to run one enormous great big engine. You've just got two small engines, fire one up and away you go. Or if you want to pull a great big heavy train, you fire the second engine up. Or if you come into difficulty with one engine packs up or a transmission, shut it down, you've still got something to be able to get you home. And that was the big draw with having hydraulics for the UK as we did in the late 50s. Because they worked, they were tried and tested in Germany, they worked fantastically and they seem to fit all the bills, but there was other influences from other manufacturers and they went with the diesel electric instead and they got rid of them all. But um, like I say, as you can see, this is what basically goes under it, which you won't see again when it's been swapped out. Yeah. And one of the things that we were talking about, I think in one of the cars we were mentioning it, but we, if we didn't get it, to, it didn't mention it to everybody. Uh, one of the difficulties about the process of getting 9010 back reunited with this is that we have to pick up 9010. If you look inside, uh -huh. you will see there's no center pin. There's no bolster it's across easy. the center like an average truck. What locates this truck and transmits the thrust are four curved plates here, here, there, and there, and these long projections mate with them. The, lo the weight of the, of the locomotive presses on this. The springs in the locomotive press on this sliding plate. That's where the weight of the locomotive is. But the thrust is on these things. And what has to happen is the locomotive has to be almost 10 feet in the air to clear those projections. And the, and the this, pilot has to clear that. And the pilot has to clear the top of that. So this thing has to be way up in the air. 9010 <laughs> has to either have Quite an expensive these go in height. The, yeah, a very expensive <laughs> yeah. height. And we only want to do that once. Yes. Yeah. So everything's got to be in order. Everything's got to be lined up. Everything has to be measured. I think we need some German project management. I think we need something <laughs> sorted out. Yeah. Everything's got to be calculated and oh, yeah. no no mess ups, no second runs. Who's got the car?